Now, before I start, I'd like to say a quick thank you to our sponsor, Net Wealth. Now, Net Wealth's wealth management service combines a comprehensive, low cost investment solution with access to qualified advisors. They recently launched My Net Wealth, which is a digital dashboard that combines all your savings and investments from multiple providers in one place. There, My Net Wealth's Wealth Planner tool helps you visualize your current wealth and apply it to your future needs. It takes into account various factors such as age, investments, pensions, tax wrappers, and expected contributions or withdrawals, and calculates the likelihood of you achieving your goals. And daily updates make it easy to track the value and performance of your wealth. Now, I've used a demo of these tools and they provide a great way to introduce high level cash flow planning into your personal finances. My Net Wealth also provides a library of useful personal finance content and if you ever need advice or guidance their highly qualified team is always there to help. You can find out more information about Net Wealth and sign up for My Net Wealth in 30 seconds by visiting mynetwealth.com. Com. Please remember the value of your investments can go down as well as up. So you may get back less than you invest. Hello and welcome to episode 419 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm good. It's been another hectic week at Money to the Masses. There's been so much going on that we're actually going to cram, I'd say, three and a half to four pieces this week because I need to do an update on what's going on in the mortgage market. We do make these shows evergreen. So the pieces that we do on the show are evergreen, meaning that you can listen to them in the future and they will still be relevant and you'll still learn stuff. But at the moment, every conversation I'm having with people who I meet out and about is about mortgage rates and what's going on in the mortgage market. And there's a lot of moving parts and things are moving very quickly. So I'm going to have to do an update on what's going on because I think if we didn't, Andy, I think we wouldn't be doing our jobs properly. Yep. So let's do that right at the beginning of the podcast. You say it's kind of three and a half pieces, really. So what are the other pieces we're going to be covering in this week's podcast? So on this week's show, we're going to be doing a piece about buy to let investing we don't do much on buy to let on the podcast but what i want to do is do a piece on where the buy to let market is and the outlook looking at things like yields and some of the potential hazards that people are experiencing as buy to let investors so a reality check of what it's really like there's a lot of stuff that's put out there that is very promotional almost for buy to let investing people always think that you've got to be investing in property if you remember andy lots of people that we know it's almost felt that if you didn't have a buy to let property in the background you were somehow failing financially so i want to give a reality check on the buy to let situation i also want to do a piece on something called concessionary mortgages. Harvey's coming onto the show. Concessionary mortgages are a product that allow you to buy a property. Let's say, for example, your parents' property at a discount. And finally, the last piece is a bit of a tax quirk that will enable you to put up to £36,000 in a year into your child's junior ISA. So I quickly wanted to talk about the chaos that's going on in the mortgage market. So everybody's asking me what's happening, what should they do? First of all, let's just talk about the Bank of England base rate. So the Bank of England base rate is obviously the rate that lots of mortgages will be based upon and predictions of where that's going to be are crucial when lenders are pricing their own mortgage products. So if you look at where the market was predicting the Bank of England base rate would peak, if you go back a couple of months, they didn't think it would get above 4%. We're already at 4.5%. But in recent weeks, the predictions have ratcheted up very quickly. As I make this podcast, they are now predicting that the Bank of England base rate could be around about 5.8% by the end of this year. So that's a significant uptick from where we are now. This has been caused by the market pricing in the likelihood of more rate increases because of inflation proving stickier than previously thought. So we've had inflation numbers come in, in official numbers, and they were higher than predicted. But also we've seen evidence that wages are going up. So if wages go up, that will push up inflation as well. So the Bank of England, therefore, is likely to have to combat that, tackle it by increasing interest rates. And lenders are reflecting that in their products, so their mortgage rates. So they've been pulling products 
and they've been raising their rates when they bring them back to the market. So where are we with mortgage rates right now? The average two-year fix is now at 6.19% if you have a 75% loan to value. A five-year fix is 5.79% assuming the same loan to value. Now, obviously, it depends on your circumstances, the rate you get, what loan to value you have. But the point is, there's been a significant increase in the just the last week, we've seen those averages go up by 0.25%. And if you look at the best rates out there, the best two years, so if we're talking about a loan to value of 60%, then you are still looking at north of 4.4%, probably somewhere heading towards 4.8% for your interest rate. So what do you got to do? If you are within six months of your mortgage deal expiring, let's say you're on a fixed deal, there are millions of people who are coming off fixed deals this year, then you should speak to a mortgage advisor and find out what your options are because you can lock into a new deal before your existing deal expires. You can even lock into a product transfer with your existing provider. The terms in which you can do that in terms of how far before the end of your deal will vary. But if you speak to a mortgage broker, they will help you. Of course, there are other things you can do if the rate and the monthly payment is going to be very high and you're going to struggle when you come to the end of your current deal. There are options you could look to extend the term of your mortgage. So there are things you can do. The message of this part of the podcast really is make sure you talk to people because the number of people I've spoken to this week when I've said, when does your deal end? And they've told me, oh, it's coming in like two or three months and I say yeah you know you can speak to a broker and you can shop around now because they're obviously concerned rates are going up all the time and all the news headlines are that take control and find out what your options are and make a decision because if you don't you'll ultimately end up on your lender's SVR the standard variable rate which is going to be very high in some cases you're going to be paying seven eight percent so don't bury your head in the sand if you're within that six month period speak to a mortgage broker. Okay, so let's start with the first piece of the podcast then, buy to let's, a bit of a reality check. Okay, so buy to let's, we don't touch upon it much on the podcast and I thought we'd do a a significant piece looking at what's going on in the buy to let market because there has been some research that's been published about what's happening in this particular area of investing. So to give you the background, where we are, the private sector landlords has experienced like remarkable amounts of growth over the last 30 years. So we went from 1.7 million landlords in 1989 to 4.6 roughly currently. Now that's been fueled by lots of different reasons, legislative changes, flexibility over rents, tenancies. So there has been a number of reasons why buy to let was very attractive. And of course, we were in a low interest rate period. So I can remember after the financial crisis where people, or just before in fact, where people were jumping on the property ladder trying to buy a house because prices were rising, they'd be able to flip the house or they would become buy-to-let landlords. So there has always been this insistence in the background that buy-to-lets were a good investment. Now, I get lots of feedback sometimes for people who are buy-to-let landlords. If I make a comment about buy-to-lets where they might feel I'm not particularly positive about it, that they'll come out and sort of give me a bit of stick. It's a bit like gold. So you have people who are very enthusiastic about investing in gold. You have that with buy-to-let investing. So first of all, let's talk about yields and rent. So that is what somebody who is going to be a landlord or looking to get into buy to let is concerned about. Now, Hamptons have released some research and it is backward looking. So they looked at 2022 and they saw that rents increased by an average of 6%. And they're predicting or forecasting that we could see an increase of 5% in 2023 and an increase of 4% in 2024. And that's even as house prices flatline or they potentially might fall. But as a landlord, you're really interested in the yield. So that's looking at that rent versus your outgoing, your capital expenditure on that particular property. Now, in the north, there is a gap. So there's a north-south divide. So in the north, typically, you're looking at a yield of about 7.4% versus 5.2% in the south of the country, which is a gap of 2.2%. So that means that there is potentially some interest if you're looking to expand a portfolio or start one by looking at areas like the northeast or the midlands so you don't obviously have to have a buy to let just where you live i think that's a mistake some people make you've got to look where you're going to get the best return now there is a a link that i'm going to put in the notes of this podcast that goes through to an article that has a list of some of the yields across the country by region and also by area so if you're looking at yields in particular
to areas and i'm going to just throw some examples like i said you can go and click on the link to find out more london you're looking at around about 4.8 percent in places like bexley and if you're going to barking and dagenham then you're going to get about 5.12 percent but if you go to the northeast so we're looking at places like sunderland middlesbrough you're going to get about 7.61 percent yield so it's much more attractive as i say you can find out more information by clicking on the link in the notes so we've done the rents we've done the yields what's going on in the market so for landlords at the moment what are they finding now there have been quite a few setbacks in recent years for landlords now the first one is the they, there was a phasing out of the tax relief that landlords could enjoy on their mortgage interest costs so that hit their profit margins and that phasing out happened up until April 2021. So previously, landlords were able to deduct the full amount of mortgage interest payments from taxable income, reducing their overall tax liability. So that changed. Then we also saw things like stamp duty increases come in. So there were additional rates of stamp duty. We've also seen changes to capital gains tax, which we covered on this podcast from April this year, which increases the tax liability if you're going to sell a property. And then we've also had the impact of rising interest rates, which I'm going to go on to now. So buy to let mortgage rates have nearly doubled since March 2022. And that's put significant pressure on landlords. Now two and five year mortgage rates are on average 6.03% compared to 3.05% and 3.29% this time last year. So you can see that's a big jump. And we've had several lenders, I mean, I'm not going to name them because this is changing all the time, that have either increased their rates in recent weeks or they've pulled their products altogether. Now, I've given average rates. Just to be positive, there are lower rates out there. The best rates you're going to get is about 4.9%. So those rising costs are having a material impact on the profitability of buy-to-let. Now, Savills give an example of a buy-to-let investor with a 70% loan to value paying income tax at a higher rate. Now, last year, this investor would have made an average profit of 23% of their rental income, even after tax. However, the figure has now plummeted to just 3.9%. So that is a huge difference. And it's because of this double whammy of taxation changes and, of course, the increased cost of borrowing. This is the side of property that people don't really talk about, and it's leveraging. So buying property, people say, oh, it's it's safe as houses. The thing with property is that it's all about leverage a lot of the time when people make money. So you're borrowing money to buy assets where the price historically has steadily increased by around about 3% per year. But the reason that it often gives people outsized gains and they can make a lot of money is because of leverage. And so it amplifies your profits, but it can also amplify your losses, which is what people are finding now. And even people personally are finding that situation where they are finding their mortgage payments on their residential homes jump in. So it's not all good news there at all. And the other thing to throw in there, there are more regulatory changes on the way. So one of those is the potential for a minimum standard of energy efficiency in rental properties. But also we've had the renters reform bill. So we're having changes being made to legislation that will change landlords rights. And one of those things is it's going to be changing something called section 21. Now previously, landlords could evict people without reason. But that's going to change. It's going to make it a little bit more difficult for landlords. We're not going to go into it on this podcast, but that will put off people who potentially might want to become landlords, but also existing landlords. So what does it mean for the market? Well, we've seen landlords start to exit the market. And when you look at the numbers, there was a piece of research that showed that the number of available rental homes had fallen by 40% over a three-year period. And this research was done just over a year ago. So we're seeing the buy-to-let market technically start to shrink, which is obviously a problem for renters because it means there is less supply of properties, but the demand for rental is still there, which is pushing up rents even higher. But for landlords, it's still often with the increased rate that are going on mortgage rates, it still might not be profitable enough for them. Now, there are things that people do where they try and hold properties via limited companies. I mean, we're not going to go into details on that. The other issue that we've got in the market, there are a lot of landlords that are getting to their own retirement ages. So currently, there are nearly 2 million buy-to-let properties owned by landlords over 65. And there's an additional 
almost 2 million properties owned by those aged between 55 and 64. Now, if that demographic decide they want to start to sell because obviously they get into an age where they might not want to be engaged in buy to let, then that could cause more problems in the market, but also particularly for renters, because it will mean that there could be a shortage of properties that they might be able to rent. But there is also a concern that we're going to see landlords shift to only wanting to rent to people who are financially stable. So people on lower incomes might find it more difficult to find properties because of the changes to legislation and obviously landlords trying to make as much profit as they can and not being able to survive if they have periods where they can't guarantee they're going to get rent. So what does this all mean then? Buy to let landlords are at the moment feeling the squeeze. There's been changes to taxation, which is obviously driven by the government's agenda. There's also been things like interest rates going up, which is having a big impact on buy to let landlords. Don't forget people have built buy to let empires based upon leverage, so borrowed money. And that cost of borrowed money is increasing rapidly. So some of those are becoming forced sellers as it starts to come down. I know most landlords only tend to have an additional property, just one property. And the other thing is that rent increases based upon some of the research, are starting to slow a little bit and the yields aren't as generous perhaps as they were before. So you're going to have to do your homework. So if you do your homework, of course, you can make buy to let work, but it's likely to work for those who are either cash buyers or who have low borrowing. So they haven't had to borrow a lot of money to be landlords. That looks like where the market is going. So if you do your homework, then of course, you can probably make money. But it is not easy. That's the point. I think some people think anybody can be a landlord. And I think that's doing a slight discredit to those out there who do it successfully because there are problems. And what we're seeing at the moment are those problems coming home to roost. Do you think also the uncertainty with house prices at the moment might be causing the uncertainty amongst potential landlords? Yeah, I think that's the case. And of course, you've got to think about not just the landlords themselves wondering whether they are going to get into being a landlord, because you could obviously have a fall in the value of the property if you decide you want to sell it. But also, I think when you're going to get lenders who are assessing landlords for for mortgages, then they're going to obviously be building at margin of error for potential pullback in house prices. And also rent. So we mentioned a while ago on the podcast that the lenders are already raising their bar when they're looking at underwriting any mortgages. So it isn't it probably as easy to get a mortgage, not only because the products are being pulled, but because lenders are going to be looking at these things probably that little bit more closely. Okay, so let's move on to the next piece of the podcast then. We're going to be welcoming Harvey back onto the show to be talking mortgages, specifically concessionary mortgages, a special type of mortgage that can provide a discount for the buyers. And Harvey's going to be talking more about that. So Harvey, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Andy. So Harvey, this was actually something I'd never heard of, concessionary mortgages. So we're going to be talking about what they are and how they can help people buy a house at a discount, particularly if it's from a family member. That's right, Damien. So essentially, a concessionary mortgage is available to people who want to buy from somebody at a discount. So perhaps a parent, a grandparent, a family member, a friend, possibly even your landlord who may wish to sell to you at a discount. And that discount can almost act as your deposit. So it's probably best to illustrate this with an example. Yeah, so the scenario that I think it fits very well with is parents who are perhaps looking to sell their own property. They're perhaps looking to release some of the equity to downsize and they're going to take the residual amount and gift it to their children anyway. Now, if your children wanted to buy your property, and that's a big if because not everyone will, but if they wanted to buy your property, you could potentially sell your property to your children at a discount. They would then pay below market value for the property and they would only pay stamp duty on that value that you've sold them to at although the the value of the property itself is going to be higher and you would take the returns downsize and you've gifted them what you intended to do anyway and now your children are on the property ladder and you've downsized successfully and you're all winning. So essentially what you're saying is the difference between the market price for the property and the discounted price that you've agreed with them that acts almost like equity like a deposit so they get a better mortgage rate with one of these concessionary mortgages because the product wraps all this up so they get a better rate and the 
person who's selling the property obviously gets the amount of money that you've agreed. But that gift, essentially, that is a gift for inheritance tax purposes. It is. Now, that gift, there are a couple of rules around the discount that you give your children or whoever it is that you're selling to at a discount. The discount can't be something that's a loan that you're later going to repay. You also can't maintain equity in that property in return for that discount. So you have to pass all of the equity on to your children who are buying from you. But that gift then, like you said, becomes liable for inheritance tax and is treated as potentially exempt transfer, which would be liable for up to seven years. So in this example, if the parents lived for seven years, then obviously that potentially exempt transfer falls out of the inheritance tax regime. So they would actually not have to pay inheritance tax on that amount of money. So this, I mean, it seems pretty niche, but there are some people out there if they're thinking they want to pass on their property to their, say, children, for example, and the children want to buy the house. And I mean, there are people where this happens, then this is something that is potentially interesting for them to look at. But they are rules around whether the parents can still live in the property, aren't there? Some lenders will allow parents to continue to live in the property. So if you've got a situation where you want to sell to your children, you're happy for all of the equity to be passed over to your children and for them to benefit from the lower LTV that they're going to experience, you can continue to live in the property with some lenders, but some lenders will not allow that to happen. And if you do continue to live in the property, you've also got to be aware that there may be some tax rules around which you have to work because there may be a requirement for you to pay towards the household costs in order for that not to then become a gift with reservation. So this is to do with, as Harvey said, gift with reservation. If you try to just gift a property to somebody and you still lived in it, then there are rules around that. that It's not classed as a gift unless you essentially have given it to them and you're paying a market rate of rent. But there's a bit bit of a grey area with this one, isn't there? We talked to various people and it seems to be there are rules you need to go and get advice on because obviously if you're living in it in conjunction, say, with your children, because a little bit of grey with how much you'd actually have to contribute, whether it's a market rate, rent, or actually something that's just a, a contribution towards the running of the house. So are these products like widespread? Are they niche? Are there not many of them? There are deals out there. Most mortgage brokers that I've talked to have some available for clients who are looking for this kind of niche product. So they're out there. What was surprising to me is that some of them offer up to 95% LTV. So perhaps you'd only have to discount your house by 5%. When you consider the cost of selling your house, that may actually be a viable thing to do to help children onto the property ladder. So therefore, it becomes quite an attractive proposition for people who are looking to buy a house. And we were talking about this earlier, Damien, and actually we sort of said the natural cycle of people sometimes is that children first move out, they grow up, become adults, move out. And then actually, as they grow, their own families tend to navigate themselves back to the areas where they grew up in order to raise their own children and in those situations might sort of look at their parents houses and think well I'd quite like to buy that yeah and another example potentially is if somebody was a parent who'd inherited a property so let's say for example they had inherited a house they might be in their 50s and they may have a younger a child who's actually a grown adult themselves who might be wanting to try and get in the property market they theoretically could perhaps down this route look to buy the property off of them that they've inherited so that essentially the adult child might be able to buy a house that's been in the family. I mean, these are niche things and it's not necessarily saying it's the best option, but it's worth bringing to the podcast because it's just a product that's out there that not many people, including me, knew existed, but it's something you can look at. As we mentioned, Harvey's done an article on the uh, Money to Masses website. Do seek advice from a mortgage broker. And if you go down this route, you'll inevitably probably best get advice from a financial advisor as well, because they can talk to you about other options. There could be things that you'd rather do things like equity release if you're after uh, money from your home, but also on the tax implications. One of the things that perhaps is worthy of note is the, the stamp duty difference. So one of the questions that I ask myself is what's the difference between selling to your children at a discount and perhaps selling to somebody else and then taking the proceeds of the sale and giving your children that to use as a deposit. And one of the advantages really in this concessionary mortgage scenario is that your children would pay stamp duty on the below market value rate of your house. So they wouldn't pay stamp duty on the full value of the house. And if they were looking to buy a house that was in the price range of the house that they're going to acquire, 
then there perhaps is a saving to be made on stamp duty there. And before we wrap this piece up, Harvey, what if the property wasn't the parent's primary residence? So let's say the scenario was this was the second property they had that they were looking to sell via this route and it was going to be bought by somebody they knew via this concessionary mortgage. What happens there with the tax implications of capital gains? So capital gains on a second property isn't going to have the same exemptions as it will do on the residential property. And actually, the difference there would be that the parents would have to pay capital gains on the market value rather than the below market value that they sold at. So if you think you're going to make a saving by selling at below market value to your children, if it's a second property that you own, then you won't make that saving. You'll have to pay at the full market value. Okay, so let's move on to the final piece of the podcast then. A bit of a quirk to do with junior ISAs and how you can maximise it to put in £36,000 in a year. So it is possible to put £36,000 into a junior ISA in a given year, even though the annual limit is £9,000. So it's £9,000 a tax year. This was put in the Telegraph actually recently. So to give them credit for it, it's just a quirk and it's very niche, but it's a quirk of taxation rules. So if you have a child trust fund for your child, then the rules around contribution are based upon their birthday. It's not tax years. So you can put in £9,000 each year based around when their birthday is. But if you move your child trust fund to a junior ISA, you can't have both. If you transfer that to a junior ISA, once it's in a junior ISA, then that resets and you can pay £9,000 per tax year. So it means in theory, if your child's birthday, for example, was the 1st of February and they had a child trust fund now, then you could put £9,000 into that child trust fund, let's say on the 30th of January. After their birthday, let's say on the 2nd of February, you could put another £9,000. So you put £18,000 into that child trust fund you could then transfer that into a junior ISA then let's say weeks later let's go for the 1st of March once the child trust fund has gone into the new junior ISA you could put another £9,000 in and then when you cross the tax year you could go and put in another £9,000 so let's say you decided to do that on the 10th of April so in a few months you put £36,000 ultimately into a junior ISA which is obviously a great use of the taxation system but that is very niche for people who are obviously wealthy but the reason I thought it was interesting for the podcast because there are lots of people out there who do have child trust funds or their children do and it's really to highlight that the contribution limits relate to the birthday of your child the child trust funds and it's tax years for junior ISA so even if you can't make use of that quirk there'll be very few people who can what it does mean is you understand there is this difference in rules but more importantly if you are about to transfer a child trust fund to a junior ISA which a lot of people do because of the wider choice you have particularly from an investment perspective with a junior ISA then you might want to bear in mind when your child's birthday is before you transfer it and so that's it we're done for this week if you want to get in touch with us you can do so in the usual way it's damien at money to the masses.com or myself andy at money to the masses.com don't forget you can review the podcast just go to your various podcast app of choice and please do choose the five star option and give us a positive review it really helps to boost the podcast out there damien we're almost done is there anything else to mention yeah just mention the facebook group so go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash money to the masses and also make sure you do follow us on all our various social media platforms particularly instagram because i love instagram and i'm on that a hell of a lot and we do put unique content on there and also on youtube so make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel so andy all that's left to be said is until next time until next time oh, oh, oh.